Welcome to the wonderful world of Ghost Horse Hollow. I'm your host, Anne Severn Williamson, and this is my Family Book Nook. My Family Book Nook podcast is brought to you by the Owsley County Public Library in Boonville, Kentucky, and by Jackson Energy, a Touchstone Energy Cooperative, and by Ghost Horse Gifts, featuring the fine intaglio jewelry and gemstone sculpture of artisan Jack Williamson on the web at www.etsy.com slash shop slash ghost horse gifts. My family book nook features the saga of the McKinnon homesteaders 100 years in the future in the Appalachian wilderness. Listeners may wish to follow along in the fairy lore of Ghost Horse Hollow, available on Amazon Books and Kindle Readers, starting with Book One, Turn of the Blade. My family book nook also shares stories, myths, and legends from around the globe in support of world literacy, conservation, and cultural exchange. And now for our ongoing adventure from the fairy lore of Ghost Horse Hollow. We left off in Ghost Horse Hollow with Farmer Jake McKinnon about to gamble with Tormac, the treacherous autumn fairy prince, under the dead oak tree. Chapter 7. Gamble Goes the Weasel. Tormac's game of roll and count was played with three twelve-sided dice. Each flat surface on the dice had five edges of equal length. One of the rolling markers was carved with magical fairy symbols that altered the value of the other two dice. Circular cards covered with strange pictures in brown ink on one side were decorated with white weasels on the other. Each hand-painted weasel held a certain number in its paws. This number also influenced the value of the three dots. The play consisted of rapid calculations and measured buffs. Nine cards were kept in the hands of the participants at all times, with a discard pile to the right of each player. A remaining draw pile was placed in a shallow crystal bowl in the center of the table. A clean win required a skilled player to match closely the sum of his nine cards with the total amount shown on the dice. Only an adept mathematician could master roll and count and keep track of the changing numbers. I shall sit here, Tormac began as several coyotes rushed around the table to prepare the game, and you, Plowman, shall sit opposite me on a three-legged stoop. The autumn fairy prince had a magnificent walnut throne placed conveniently behind him. He was obviously enjoying the contrast between his own wealthy trappings and the farmer's poverty. A narrow clay goblet of rotten apple wine was presented to each player with great formality. Tormac's goblet resembled that of an elegant crane, while the human player received a cup in the shape of a duck. The prince squirmed with suppressed mirth. He rightly suspected that Jake was illiterate, at least concerning the three fairy languages that Panther had mastered during her years of study with Queen Tritrimia. The autumn fairy did not suspect that the teenage girl had received in-depth training at the Starlight Fairy Court. Tormac believed that Jake's lack of expertise guaranteed the prince's win. Tormac settled gracefully on his throne, His silken cape flowed over the impressive furniture like an orange river. Panther joined her father at the table, standing quietly beside his humble stool. She placed a firm, gloved hand on Jake's shoulder. Don't worry, she whispered. The fairy queen taught me to read every card, and I can do all the calculations in my head. Try not to draw the tenth weasel, if you can. Why not the tenth? McKinnon asked, his eyes narrowing with worry. He had been busy observing the restless movements of the coyote pack. Their leader pretended to be scratching at a troublesome flea. Both anxious and isolated, Lord Vixus was an unpredictable factor in the night's proceedings. The coyote king had obviously played this game before, but was doing his best not to alarm the farmer. 
the tenth weasel calls for an instant sacrifice. Someone around this gambling table must die. Aaron Ray interrupted softly. Panther and Jake turned sharply toward the metal worker as the barrel-chested man stepped up beside the McKinnon. Aaron looked determined. His eyes were riveted on Tormac's glittering brow. Move over, Jake. Let me take this hand. You're not a gambling man. You said so yourself. But Aaron, when did you learn to play roll and count? Jake asked surprised. I didn't always belong to the Blue Hills, Aaron Ray began. Remember, I grew up in the flooded city. I did clean the dog cages, but I also learned to survive on the streets mostly by boxing and playing cards. Besides, I've spent some time with the Moonlight Fairies up in Wildcat Holler, learning this game. They taught me well. I can defeat this royal pain for you, but I'll need Panther to translate the signs on the weasel cards. Jake hesitated. Tormac was watching the humans with lowered lids, his slender fingers in a relaxed prayer position. The farmer knew that Aaron was making a once-in-a-lifetime offer. The metal worker had suffered a rough past, which he preferred not to discuss. His offer to take Jake's place before such a shifty, arrogant enemy was most unexpected. Take him down, McKinnon replied. He slid off the three-legged stool and stood behind his friend. A groundling? Tormac's eyebrows arced in disbelief. Surely even you, plowman, would not stoop so low as to allow a common worker to play in your stead. McKinnon folded his arms across his chest. He's my equal in every way, Autumn Prince. Each homesteader is a member of the Ghost Horse family. Hannah and I don't keep servants or groundlings, as you well know. What a pity, Tormek scoffed. Be seated then, plowman's equal. Drink all the wine in your ducky goblet. What does it matter? You will still fail to win my weasel game, and the cloak of weeds will soon be mine. With a twist of his wrist, the autumn fairy prince upturned his chalice and sloshed down the rotten apple wand. Without hesitating, Aaron Ray did the same. Both gamblers tossed their empty cups to one another. Each opponent then smashed the pottery against the heavy blackened stones that surrounded the fire pit. As crimson flames shot upward from the shards of broken clay, Panther took a deep breath to steady her nerves. The risky game had begun. At first, the players sat quietly, while a member of the coyote pack shuffled the cards. Panther noted that the dealer was none other than Yellow Mama, the oldest of the half-feral dogs. She wore a bandana around her neck and gold hoops in her ears. Surprisingly, Yellow Mama walked stiffly upright on her hind legs. She seemed to have a fondness for Aaron Ray and kept nipping at him over the cards. Perhaps the dealer knew the metal worker from the card games held down in Wildcat Hollow. Panther wondered if Yellow Mama was distributing the cards fairly. The coyote dog winked at the girl. It appeared that Tormac's dealer had filed her canine teeth for Yellow Mama's sharp fangs kept poking out over her lower jaw. Well, pick up, pick up, Tormac hastily gestured toward the nine circular cards in front of Aaron Ray. The royal fairy's speedy fingers toyed with the three dice. Beat this roll, metal man, the prince snickered, releasing his hand. The onlookers around the alabaster table strained to see the outcome of Tormac's opening roll. Two of the tumbling markers landed with the number 11, clearly displayed on their upturned sides. The third die that wobbled into place was blank, which automatically doubled the value of the other two dice. By the dark stars, I do believe there is only one row that can possibly atop that sum, Tormac gloated. Will you accept the toss? Or is it not to your liking, my unworthy opponent? I accept the rope, Aaron Ray replied calmly. He then proceeded to scoop the three dice into his own calloused palm, and with a smooth snap of his fist, spilled the markers beside the discard bowl. Panther gasped. 
All three of the upturned sides were blank. He had rolled a triple void, a nearly impossible feat. Do you accept the toss? Oh, decaying one, Aaron countered. The autumn fairy prince colored with rage. His tattered wings flexed, but for an instant. Panther shuddered at the sight, for Tormac's appendages resembled brilliant maple leaves, faded and riddled with holes. As the royal fairy closed his wings with a crisp smack, McKinnon looked back to see White Hand steadying the horses. Ghost horse mounts were normally peaceful and quiet. They would stand obediently in one spot if the rider but lowered the reins to the ground. Tonight, White Hand held the two stallions and the two mares close to his side. Jake could tell that the sound of Tormac's popping wings had unnerved his equine friends. The whites of their eyes gleamed in the dim, crimson light. Jake's attention was drawn back to the game. Never had he seen two players so equally matched. Panther was translating the weasel card signs as if she were reciting a long, rapid chant. As her beautiful voice droned into the night, the discard pile grew steadily, and the tallies shot up. <laughs> Draw the sixth in the meadow, seventh weasel in the shade. Play an ace to the middle, lest the joker be unmade. Keep the three to the right in the little mushroom veil. Twist the vine, add the nine, grab the weasel by the tail. If an eight arrives too late, Roll again, make it wait, king or queen in the ring. Count back ten to the date. The girl paused. Count back ten to the date. But which date? Panther murmured to herself. Should I use the thirteen-month lunar calendar of the fairy folk, or the twelve-month sun calendar designed long before the time of great change? Aaron Ray waited without moving a muscle for his translator to continue. The metal worker's dark eyes speared through Tormac's opposing gaze. Panther's thoughts rushed ahead. It was a fairy's game. The autumn prince despised all slow-moving wingless humans. The girl was almost certain that Tormac would be calculating the game by the older moon charts. With a ragged breath, Panther made up her mind, knowing there was no room for error. Today is the 17th. No, eighteenth day of the lunar month, she corrected herself shakily. Subtract eighteen from the last roll, Aaron. Jake McKinnon glanced upward. The moon had just passed beyond the rolling hills and was beginning to descend. The ghost horses pawed the ground impatiently as their hooves smacked the barren soil. The hungry coyotes erupted with their odd, skittering laughter. Steady! Steady, the farmer's voice rang out. He placed a hand on Aaron's upper back. Can you win this? The horses won't stand for much more. I call for final draw, Aaron demanded with a nod to Jake. The gambler placed his remaining weasel cards in a fan on Tormac's table. This part of my Family Book Nook podcast is dedicated to world conservation. Everyone can make a difference by restoring the world's forests, conserving energy, recycling, developing and sharing green technologies, farming organically, preserving wilderness, and protecting our pollinators. To live in harmony with the earth, is to respect the sacred hoop of life. And now, our adventure continues. Final draw. Very well, Plowman's equal. How quickly time flies when one is winning. Tormac chuckled greedily. The coyotes whooped. Perhaps their royal fairy host and their nervous king would provide a bit of horse flesh for them after all. Pack nudged closer to the table, eager to witness the prince's final move. Tormac plucked a card from the remaining deck and snorted with mirth. Observe, plowman. I chose the jack of weasels, and my score is already 1,002. That means I have a grand total of 1,000. 
and twenty-three. Look, look, my cards closely match the sum on the three dice as well. Yummy, the cloak of wheels is mine. Not so fast, Pumpkin Fairy, Aaron Ray protested. I have yet another card to draw. Have you forgotten that my score is nine hundred and eighty-nine? By the dust of the earth, how could you possibly add to so high a number? Tormek exclaimed. Prince was trembling with agitation. He could not believe that the groundling seated before him had actually kept up with the game. Score, keeper, the prince screeched. Read us the numbers at once. Yellow Mama strutted forward clearing a path for her swinging hips with well-placed snaps and growls. Her golden hoops bounced up and down like the wheels of a gypsy wagon. Here is the official tally. Oh, Autumn Prince, she rasped, his esteemed majesty, one thousand and twenty-three. The fine human from Ghost Horse Hollow, before his final draw, stands at nine hundred and eighty-nine. The coyote is shifted uneasily from paw to paw. The horses shifted uneasily from hoof to hoof, torn sank back down in his throat and ground his teeth. Proceed, the royal sprite hissed. McKinnon watched as the autumn prince casually crossed and uncrossed his legs, feigning detachment from the outcome of the game. The farmer from Ghost Horse Hollow knew better. He leaned toward his daughter, whose magic cloak was fluttering about her booted ankles. It was the only sound in the night. Why is Tormac so afraid? Jake asked, barely moving his lips. Panther's knowledge of the intricate game had proven invaluable. The father had faith in his daughter's quick mind. The prince knows that his rival is still able to defeat him. Aaron has 989 points, but 999 is considered to be the luckiest score in the game. Only one other gambler in the entire history of Roll and Count has ever called for final draw with such a perfect hand. The Fairy Queen was quite specific on this point, for the player was none other than Sir Phineas Glowgold's younger brother. Sir Stephen Glowgold is still believed to be in Tormac's dungeon, where he was imprisoned after winning the game. The rules clearly state that 999 defeats any higher number. If the next card is a 10, then Aaron will win the game, Panther quietly informed her father. McKinnon now understood just how perilous the next move could be. He made a gesture before his back for White Hand to move the horses a little closer to the table. Jake noted that Aaron Ray was gripping his double-bladed axe beneath the table. Only Panther could see that the metal worker's free hand was trembling ever so slightly when he flipped over the last car. A swirl of activity rocked through the midnight gathering of fairy folk, humans, and wild beasts. The tenth weasel curled into a ball on the upturned card, leered at them all. It demanded an instant sacrifice. No one wanted to be the game's victim. Everyone pulled away from the table, leaving a tornado-like eye of stillness in the center of the barren glen. Cards scattered as a gust of wind whipped through the gathering. I'll take that book you're sitting on, Farmer McKinnon began. The score stands at one less than a thousand. And you, Autumn Prince, have lost this game. I never lose, bawled Tormac, overturning his woody throne. His maple wings completely unhinged, exposing the prince's dark, decaying veins. Tormac drew a slender sword of incredible workmanship from his jeweled belt. It was stamped to the hilt, with runes for both speed and accuracy. Panther's father answered by unsheathing his own magic blade. The gold lions engraved on McKinnon's fine weapon roared in defiance. Aaron, get Panther's horse, the farmer commanded. We need to get my girl out of here now. Not so fast, 
dirty plowman, Tormac shouted over the howling coyotes and neighing horses. If I concede your victory, then the girl becomes my choice for the weasel dip. Rules are rules, are they not? She will not leave this forest alive, and her magic cloak will still be mine. The autumn prince bared his lower teeth as he spat out his chilling words. A wisp of cold air stung her cheeks when Panther's father tossed her slender daughter onto the back of her mare. Aaron Ray jumped back to assist White Hand with the other horses, who were tugging frantically at their reins. McKinnon then swirled to face his adversary, just as Tormek's sword lashed across the gaming table. Jake's blade met the prince's attack with such fury that even the Starlight Kingdom's highly decorated Captain of the Guards, Sir Tullian Richfield, could not have counterattacked more courageously. McKinnon's bright weapon danced in the uneven light with razor-sharp maneuvers. The Lion Guards were reputed to be the best sword mages in all the fairylands, but Tormac's wicked techniques put Jake's superior blade to the test. As the duel progressed, the Autumn Fairy Prince pressed the farmer up against the stone table with a powerful thrust of his bejeweled forearm. McKinnon countered by kicking Tormac in the chest. The stunned fairy staggered backward, cursing his useless decaying wings. Both fighters then spun sideways, the tips of their weapons landing inches away from each other's throats. You fight well for a corn planting chick raising goat milking half-breed torment goaded oh yes i know all about your mother what a fool she was falling in love with a tree spirit the judge lore himself warned them both but your mother insisted on the marriage how revolting a dryad prince uniting with a wingless horsemaid Tormac rolled his eyes Shortly after you and your two brothers were born, Lord Elevar's stump was toasted, and poor Gabriel McKinnon became a part of the woods. Permanently, I saw to that myself. Jake was visibly shaken. He almost lowered his sword. You killed my mother? He stammered. It was proclaimed that she drowned at the Triad Falls. Let's just say she made quite a splash at the bottom. Tormac snickered at his own ghastly joke. Aaron Ray and Jonas Whitehand <laughs> instinctively released the horse's reins and came to the aid of their friend. Two axes spun past either side of McKinnon's head. The sharp blades caught the prince's tattered wings, lifting Jake's proud adversary high above the coyotes. Tormac struck frantically to free himself with a downward beat of his appendages. But the whirling axes pinned him securely to the dead oak tree. Kicking with violent frustration, Tormac dangled above his slobbering followers. After them! After them, you worthless whelps! If that girl lives through this night, I promise each of you I will stretch your hides upon this dead tree! The prince screeched at the top of his lungs. Panther was jolted in his sight as a lestiel's opal moon reared and pawed the cold night air. Old Spit, the snaggletooth messenger who had delivered the evening summons to McKinnon, lay crouching beside the throne of the coyote king. The scruffy servant had been waiting for just such an opportunity to prove his worthiness to the pack. Old Spit snatched at the pale mare's rump with his claws and broken teeth, leaving a bloody scar near the left of the horse's thick flowing tail. The mare leapt across the fire pit in a first of speed. Thank you for listening to my Family Book Nook podcast. Subscribe to our blog at myfamilybooknook.blogspot.com and follow us on Facebook, Pinterest, and YouTube at Ghost Horse Hollow and Ghost Horse Gift Gallery. To advertise with my family book nook, 
Contact Podbean's Pod Ads program for more information. Join us each Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Time USA for another episode in the exciting saga of the McKinnon Homesteaders, as well as stories from around the globe. Podbean.com podcasts are available through a convenient app on your PC, tablet, or cell phone. Listen anytime. We appreciate your sharing my family book nook episodes with your friends and family on social media. Watch it grow. Special thanks to the lovely Price Sisters on the web at thepricesisters.com for our closing music. Follow me on Instagram and underscore ghost underscore horse. This is Anne Severn Williamson, and it's been a pleasure.